Hello everyone and welcome to our session, Managing Your Cluster the GitOps Way. Um, we'll introduce ourselves. My name is Nishant Kumar and I work for uh, Microsoft as a senior software engineer and I'm a developer at the Azure Operator Distributed Systems product and I have with me. Uh, hi, I'm Uday uh, T. Kumar. I work for Zeta Technologies where we are revolutionizing the uh, world of banking. I'm an engineering manager heading a team of uh, DevOps engineers. Thank you, Uday. So talking about the agenda, I'll talk about what is uh, GitOps, uh, why do we use GitOps, what are the, some of the benefits, uh, GitOps principle, uh, and then Uda is going to uh, talk about a specific tool, uh, Argo CD, and talk about this architecture features and provide a demo. And then I'll be talking about some of the GitOps uh, challenges, and uh, then we'll end up with the comparisons with uh, some other open source tools. So what is GitOps? Uh, it is a way of implementing continuous deployment for cloud native applications and it was a term which was coined by Weaveworks in 2017. And the core idea of GitOps is having a Git repository that contains declarative, uh, that contains declarative descriptions of the infrastructure uh, currently uh, desired in the target environment and an automated process to make the environment match the uh, described state in the repository. So if you want to deploy a new application or update an existing one, uh, you only need to update the repository uh, and, automate, and an automated process handles everything else. So it's like having a cruise control uh, for managing your applications. And Kubernetes specifically enables uh, GitOps by um, fully embracing declarative APIs as its uh, primary mode of operation. And why GitOps? Uh, because you can deploy faster and more often uh, since all of your artifacts are stored in your Git repositories, uh, you could be sh uh, sure that there are no manual changes or any some random script that is running in your environment. Uh, so it's really uh, good that you go into the Git repository, make your changes, and just click the button, and you're sure it's going to uh, match the desired state with the current state. And also you have faster uh, error recovery for free. So let's say the production environment is down, a big deal. Uh, but with GitOps, uh, you have a complete uh, history of how your environment has changed over time. Uh, and this makes error recovery as easy as is issuing a Git uh, reward and watching your environment uh, uh, being restored. Uh, and the Git record is then not just an audit log, but also a transaction, transactional log. And you can roll uh, back and forth as many times you want. Can I ask a question? Yeah. If you don't mind, can we take the questions towards yeah. the end? Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. yeah. Thank you. So yeah. it also make, makes our uh, deployments uh, secure. So GitOps allows you to manage deployments completely from inside your environment. Uh, for that, your environment only needs access to your repository and image, image registry, uh, and that's it. You don't have to give your developers direct access to the environment uh, because, as you know, the kube details in your SSH. And then you have self-documenting uh, deployments. So have you ever uh, logged in into an environment and wondered what's already what's deployed here? So that's really a pain um, uh, when you really log into some environment. But with Git repositories, everything is declared there. You just log into your Git repo and you want to find out what's deployed in the environment. You don't need to even log in. You just check the Git repository and everything is uh, out there. So some principles of GitOps: uh, the entire system must be described. Uh, declaratively. Uh, so with GitOps, Kubernetes is just uh, one example of many uh, cloud uh, native tools that are declarative and can be uh, treated as code. And with your ap application uh, declaration version in Git, uh, you have a single source of truth. So your apps can then be easily deployed and rolled back to and from Kubernetes. Uh, and even more importantly, when disaster strikes, your clusters infrastructure can be independently, independently and quickly responded. And that system is then version and immutable. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, everything is stored in Git and serving as your canonical source of truth. So you have a single place from which everything is derived uh, and driven as well. And then approved changes uh, that can be automatically applied to the system. So once you have declared state that is stored in Git, uh, the next step is to allow any changes uh, to the state to be automatically applied to your system. So what's significant about this is that you don't need cluster credentials to make changes to your system. And then your uh, systems are continuously reconciled. 
So once the state of your system uh, is declared and kept under version control, uh, software agents can inform you uh, whenever the current state is not matching the uh, desired state. And the use of agents also ensures that uh, your entire system is self-healing. And by self-healing, we don't just mean uh, any nodes or pods failure, because those are just handled by Kubernetes. Uh, but even some manual errors, like if someone comes into an environment, deletes a deployment which is uh, by mistake or not intended, uh, then the reconciliation loop will actually check what is there in the Git, and it's going to um, undo all the changes which was done by a human. And then there are two ways uh, of how you deploy a cluster, either uh, via pull-based or push-based system. So with, with push-based, you use a CI-CD pipeline to uh, push changes to your environment. And then the pipeline is triggered by the code commit or merge. Uh, and with pull-based uh, GitOps, an agent running inside your uh, environment continually continuously pulls a Git repo uh, or container registry for changes. And when it detects a mismatch uh, between uh, the defined state and the running state, uh, the agent pulls the defined configuration into the environment. So pull-based, uh, first of all, it increases the security because the, uh, agent running, because the agent is running inside the cluster, so there's no need to store your credentials in your external CI, uh, and it makes more of your environment more consistent as uh, push GitOps typically only works in one direction, from JIT report to your environment, and pull-based uh, uh, deployments work in both the directions. It, it actually pulls from your Git repo uh, into your uh, environment. So this can detect and remediate configuration drift uh, in the event that changes that are made to the cluster manually or from other sources. So here are some of the uh, popular open source tools, Argo CD, Flux, Jenkins, Weave, GitOps Core, Pipe CD, and, and th there will be many more that you'll find out in the internet. But in this talk, Uday is going to specifically focus on Argo CD, uh, talk about its architecture, and uh, provide a demo. And then I'll uh, talk about some of the challenges and comparisons. So I'll hand out over to Uday. Thanks, Nishant. So uh, Argo CD is uh, a very widely used tool, uh, one of the many open source tools that uh, we try to uh, contribute to, customize, and use at uh, Zeta Tech. Uh, it allows one to use any Git-based repository, whether it's GitHub, GitLab, or uh, Bitbucket. Uh, specifically with respect to Kubernetes, uh, the manifest can be specified in any number of ways, uh, customize, Helm, or just plain vanilla YAML or JSON manifests as well. Uh, it also supports any custom management tool, uh, which can be configured as a plugin uh, for the purpose of config management as well. Argo CD can work with um, many of the commonly used ingress controllers, including Ambassador, Nginx, Contour, Traffic. In fact, uh, in the, if you go through the Argo CD documentation, it has sample manifest files, which uh, act as a quick starter reference. And uh, I suggest you do check the documentation out. Uh, Argo uh, CD supports uh, two major deployment types, multi-tenant with UI and CLI, and the core, which only comes with the CLI. Uh, multi-tenant uh, installation is the most common installation type where multiple dev teams can access it and collaborate, uh, uh, and uh, it is uh, basically via the API servers, uh, which, is, uh, which uses the web UI as well as the CLI. Uh, now, this further has uh, two modes, uh, the HA and the non-HA. Uh, the uh, HA uh, is basically a kind of version of the non-HA, but it supports uh, the uh, HA and uh, resiliency, as the name suggests. Now, the non-HA is strictly not for production use. It is more for demo or evaluation. Uh, no prizes for guessing what mode I'm going to be using in my demo today. Uh, now, when it comes to both of these modes, uh, there are two ways uh, in, or means in which they can be deployed. Uh, there is an install.yaml, where Argo CD is installed in the same uh, cluster as uh, the rest of the applications. And there is a uh, namespace-install.yaml uh, file, where Argo CD is uh, installed in a completely different cluster uh, uh, as compared to the applications. Uh, the difference is whether somebody wants it in the same cluster or not. And for various reasons of security, uh, amongst other things. Uh, 
Uh, the last mode, of course, is the core. Uh, core, as mentioned earlier, does not include the API server at all. Uh, we'll discuss a little more about the components in the next slide, uh, and therefore does not have a UI. So this is essentially if the cluster admins uh, want to have an independent setup, uh, and uh, they want to run a, a specific instance of Argo CD, this is a more preferred way because it's lightweight. It does not have the um, HA components built in, and uh, everything is done via CLI. Let's look at uh, a little bit of the architecture, which will help you understand uh, what we were talking about earlier. Uh, now, most uh, there are three major things, API server, repository server, and the application controller. So API server, as uh, most of us would guess, is uh, the communication is what enables the communication, most of the communication with the rest of the world. Uh, the API server is basically a gRPC or REST server, which exposes the API consumed by uh, the web UI, the CLI, and also the CI/CD systems. Uh, it takes care of a couple of things: application management and status reporting, uh, then invoking of application operations such as sync, rollback, and any user-defined actions that might be put in. Uh, uh, repository and cluster credential management, that is, which are stored as KH secrets or can be delegated to a, 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 any of the uh, external or third party uh, authentication or IAM management uh, tools. Then authentication and auth delegation, as I mentioned, uh, RBAC enforcement, and uh, in case uh, somebody has Git web, uh, webhook events, uh, it can uh, also act as a listener or forward for them. The next one is the repository server. Now, as the name suggests, this is basically an internal service which takes a local cache of whatever is present in the Git repository itself. Uh, and uh, it holds the application manifest. Now, it is responsible for generating and returning any Kubernetes manifest uh, when certain inputs are required. Now, what are those inputs? It's your typical uh, Git-based uh, inputs, such as the repository URL, the, any revisions, application path, uh, template-specific settings like uh, parameters parameters or uh, environment variables or helm uh, values.yaml. And finally, the, there's the application controller. Now, it is, the, it is basically nothing but a Kubernetes controller which monitors running applications and compares the current live state with the desired target state uh, as specified in the repo. It detects any out of sync applications. Uh, what actually happens, you will get a better idea when you look, uh, when we go through the demo. Uh, and uh, now what I mean by uh, out of sync application over here is that uh, suppose we've made a change in the GitHub repository and it is not what is deployed currently. So that's where it says, okay, that this is the desired state and this is not currently what it is. And it can sometimes optionally take actions as well. Uh, optionally, why? Because we can enable manual sync or auto sync as well. Uh, that's something, again, which you will get a better idea during the demo. Uh, it is also responsible for invoking any user-defined hooks uh, for lifecycle events. This is for any advanced uh, deployments when you have canary or blue-green deployments uh, in place. Now, uh, here's uh, some of the major features. Uh, now, when it comes to the features, I tend to categorize them into five major category and uh, try to remember them uh, using an acronym, uh, S-A-L-A-D, SALAD. Uh, yes, guys, it's a post-lunch talk, so uh, I had the option of using Dallas or SALAD, so went with SALAD. Uh, S stands for state. So automated uh, configuration drift detection. When an application moves away from its desired state, as I mentioned earlier, it uh, finds that out and it syncs it. It also provides visualization. There is a big yellow icon which comes up saying uh, this is out of sync. And uh, as I mentioned, for any advanced or complex application rollouts, it supports, uh, it supports hooks for pre-sync, sync, and post-sync. Then there's the API part for A, where uh, as we've um, already uh, discussed, there's a web UI which provides any real-time view. Uh, there's a CLI for automation or CI integration and webhook integration for GitHub, uh, Bitbucket, or GitLab. The L is for logs and metrics. It can always look at the health status and uh, give an analysis of what is going on, audit trails, and also supports Prometheus metrics. Then A stands for auth. There's an SSO integration via various methods and third-party tools. OIDC, OAuth2, uh, GitHub, GitLab, uh, LinkedIn, Microsoft, etc. It supports multi-tenancy and RBAC policies for authorization and access tokens for automation as well. 
Uh, and finally, the D stands for deployment, uh, automated deployment of applications to specified uh, target environments, rollback or roll anywhere to any application configuration committed in a Git repository. Uh, multiple config management templating tools are supported, as we said, customize Helm or even plain vanilla JSON uh, files. And it has the ability to manage and deploy to multiple clusters. Uh, let's now talk go through the demo. So we tried to do a live demo, but uh, the demo gods were not with us. So you can see how the installation is done. Basically, uh, a namespace is added, and we need to do a kube CT CTL apply of the GitHub uh, account. So I've done that already over here. Uh, and uh, when we do a kube CTL get all in the namespace for Argo CD, we can see a whole bunch of uh, things that are deployed. Uh, so we can see the services, the the deployments, the pods, and the replica sets, and a stateful set. We'll grab a, a hold of the load balancer IP, and uh, this is already deployed. So in case we were to, it's already deployed, but just for the sake of the demo, I'm putting it out there again, and you can see it comes up. I've already configured the GitHub repository. Uh, all we need to do is go to uh, repositories and click on connect. So you can see that I've set up something specifically for this demo. Uh, currently, it has nothing but a, a simple readme file. And now what we are going to do is I've already configured uh, some YAML files, which we will use. I'm creating a new app on Argo CD itself. I'll give it a name. Uh, this is going to be a simple Nginx application. So just Nginx test. The project will be default. Uh, the sync policy, we'll keep it for uh, manual for now. A repository URL, since the repository is set up, the repository URL is, uh, comes in as a prompt. The path, I can put in any optional directories I want. I've just put in a dot for now. The cluster URL will be the Kubernetes uh, default URL. I've used microcates uh, over here. And uh, I've put in the namespace as GitOps, which I've uh, specified as well. It could be just as uh, default as well, the default namespace as well. You can see it's healthy and synced, because currently in the repository, there's nothing, absolutely nothing, except for the readme file. Uh, now, uh, as I mentioned, there's uh, Nginx YAML file, which I've already um, set up to save us some time. I'm going to copy it into the uh, GitHub uh, repository and uh, then push it onto GitHub. The, uh, and I'll, I'll open it up in a bit and uh, show you what we've done. We're, go we're just going to uh, uh, push this. You may have, and run some commands which you may have uh, seen 100 times. Uh, we've kept it just for the sake of the demo to show that it's not some pre-baked, pre-configured things. You can see the YAML file over here. Uh, the containers have been set up. The port has been set up. Uh, notice the number of replicas was just two. Uh, and we're going to push that in now. Usual git add, git commit, and git push. And there we are. So while uh, that happens, uh, let's go back to the application, and uh, you can see that it, it's just showing Nginx test. If I were to do a refresh, it now shows uh, out of sync because the manifests have been pushed into uh, GitHub, and it is saying that the desired state and the con current active state are not in sync. So we can click on app diff to see what the difference is. We can see that the services and the deployments are showing whatever I had uh, earlier uh, shown on the YAML files. Now we hit a quick sync. Sync has a couple of options like prune. Uh, prune is when you have a certain uh, application and you want those pods to be killed and have new pods created. For example, we are upgrading an, uh, from one Nginx version to another or from one application version to another. You can see that as soon as I've synced, uh, the services have come up and two new uh, pods have come up as well, which are getting created. I will now uh, just do a kubectl uh, get all, and uh, we, we can check what is the status of that on the CLI. And we can see in the namespace GitOps, the status of the pods are container creating. That should uh, come up in a minute. Uh, 
Uh, now we can see it is in running state. Let's go back to the UI. Yes, it's in a running state. And uh, if we pick up the cluster IP and we are to enter it, voila, Nginx is up and running. Now this is where we get to see what happens when uh, there is a drift in the current state and the desired state. So uh, I'm going to modify the YAML, change the replicas from two to four uh, so that we actually create a drift in the current state and the desired state. And the usual uh, git base commands, git add, git commit, and git push. There we go. So let's again find out if the status has been synced. But before that, let's take a look at what is there on GitHub. You can see that uh, the file has been updated. The number of replicas is four. Let's do a quick refresh to see if everything is hunky-dory. It's not, because it's again out of sync. The app difference this time clearly points out that the number of replicas is the only factor that has changed from two to four. And uh, we can hit a sync. And again, the number of options are still the same. As soon as we hit sync, uh, we should see two more uh, pods coming up. There we see one has come up. And, this, and the fourth one. Let's quickly check on the CLI as well. And we can see that uh, two new pods have come up. Both the statuses are container creating. Now, the app difference, uh, or the app uh, uh, details, rather, uh, shows us various options. One of them is to enable uh, auto-sync, wherein uh, Argo CD would do the job of refreshing it, checking every now and then, and then uh, doing the actual sync. And we can delete the application as well, uh, which will delete the entire application. We can see all the four pods are up and running and in a healthy status. With that, over to Nishant. Um, thank you, Uday. So I will talk uh, about some of the GitOps uh, challenges. So far what Uday has shown is uh, you have a Git repository, um, and then within Argo CD you provide a source, and then Argo CD would ensure that whatever is the uh, desired state is then turned into the uh, current state. But what happens, how, but the challenges occur, how do you create those um, manifest file which resides in your Git repositories? So that's one of the challenges. And then the second one is, how do you do secret management? So I'll, I'll talk about both of them. So there are two uh, popular open source uh, options for managing your manifest files, uh, which is a building blocks for your applications. So one of them is Helm. So Helm is a package manager for uh, Kubernetes. And it, with, with the help of Helm, you can actually package your applications, uh, its dependencies, and it, is a, it has a templating language. So uh, you can use that to uh, uh, deploy, uh, up, deploy, upgrade, install uh, your applications uh, on your environment. And then the second option is uh, customize. So customize uses purely Kubernetes YAML files. And, uh, and with Helm, what you get is you have a values.yaml file. So if within that single values.yaml file, you can substitute uh, all of the values that you want to, uh, let's say, update. If you want an image to update, you can go and change in the values.yaml, and then it will reflect in all the other places that those that image has been uh, getting used. It could be in your deployment or any other files. Um, similarly, in customize, it also it has a customization.yaml file. Again, it's a single YAML file where you can provide your uh, substitutions. Uh, if you want to update your image, you can go and update in that customization.yaml file. Uh, the only benefit that I see with customize is you don't get the complexity of uh, Helm templating language. Uh, if you really want to uh, do some complex logic, then Helm templating language can be very overwhelming. Uh, but in case with uh, customize, since it's just pure Kubernetes YAML file, it's, uh, it's pretty straightforward. So if you understand a Kubernetes manifest file, you already understand customize. 
Uh, and, and something else uh, which is supported and customized is uh, a concept called overlays. So if you want different configurations for your different environments, um, let's say a dev or production environment, then it is natively supported within Customize. So it's, it's really a good tool, and I would uh, recommend you to go and explore that. And, and the next thing is uh, secret management. So uh, you might be aware there are multiple open source uh, secret management tools like uh, HashiCup, uh, Vault, External Secrets, Operator. But uh, since this is a GitOps talk, uh, how do you really store your uh, secret in your Git repositories? I mean, I mean right now, without uh, uh, GitOps or without a good solution, you, need, you can't store your uh, secrets directly in your Git repositories because it's just Base64 encoded by default in Kubernetes, and it is not encrypted. So either you'll have to use some third-party solutions wherein your secrets are stored somewhere else, and in the runtime, uh, that gets substituted in your environment. Uh, or you can use uh, another tool called Bitnami Sealed Secret. So the special thing about, is, about that tool is you can actually store your secrets along with your manifest file in this same, same Git repository. So sealed secret is a, a one-way encrypted secret uh, that can be created by anyone, uh, but can only be de decrypted by the controller that is running inside the target cluster. So, uh, and once it is encrypted, it can then be uh, safely uploaded, uploaded to your Git repositories. And it has, uh, it, uh, sealed secret is composed of two parts. One is a cluster side controller and operator, uh, and that is used to uh, decrypt your secret, and then there's a client-side uh, tool called kubeseal. Uh, so in the example, you can see uh, on the right-hand side, you have a, a normal Kubernetes uh, uh, secret, and using kubeseal, uh, you can actually encrypt, and on the right-hand uh, bottom side, it creates a sealed secret, the kind is sealed secret, and uh, the data section is completely encrypted, and now you can upload that secret into our Git repositories. And then uh, the controller, once you apply this, that secret in the environment, the controller would already be running, and that controller will decrypt the secrets on the fly and make it available to your pods. So again, an interesting tool uh, that you can explore. And here are some of the uh, comparisons for uh, different tools available in upstream. This might be a little bit outdated uh, since, I mean, the open source community is continuously e evolving. Uh, but yeah, like Flux, Flux, V2, Argo CD, uh, Pipe CD, Junkinex, these are some of the really popular tools uh, that uh, I think uh, you can go and explore. And I would like, I would like to thank all the awesome um, blog posts uh, available on the internet uh, because it was really useful in uh, putting the content out for this talk. So yep, uh, thank you for, for attending this talk. Yeah. So, And uh, any questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, take. I it think he had a. Yeah. So um, as I said, for the cluster admin, you can always have a separate CLI-based uh, deployment. And uh, there are a whole bunch of things where your Argo CD, uh, or rather uh, your Kubernetes cluster itself can be deployed. So there are a lot of uh, charts which comes in Helm, which is what we uh, typically tend to use. And uh, in fact, in OpenStack itself, the Airship project is one such project where all the charts are written, where you can deploy OpenStack on top of Kubernetes, have the Kubernetes itself deployed, and that entire set of manifests, you can have it in a GitHub repository, you can have Argo CD, and uh, you can choose what mode you want and have the entire thing deployed. Do you use a production? Uh, not uh, in my current organization, but in a previous organization we have done that. Yeah. Okay. No problem. 
So I think uh, we may have just crossed time, guys. So if any, there are any questions, you can come to us and we can yeah. talk one of them. Thank you.